Good to see you all. And uh, we're here this week continuing second part in uh, this series working through the book of Hosea and not necessarily a book that gets a lot of attention typically from the, the pulpit. And so had a compliment last week, in fact, that uh, a senior saint in our uh, ministry here said, you know, I never thought you could get so much from that first chapter. So I saw that as a, a compliment. And I feel like as we've spent a lot of time in the New Testament, I think it's important as to have a complete diet to have some uh, Old Testament as well to get to know our God. And so last week we we're introduced to a, a character by the name of Hosea, the, uh, the, one of the main two characters in this message. And in this, it's basically God wanting to convey a message to Israel through this particular man. But it's not just saying what the message is. He wants Hosea to be a, a real life, tangible uh, object lesson, if you will, for the audience to learn from. So he's asking Hosea to live out the pain and the uh, experience that God himself has when dealing with uh, adulterous people. So you remember last week, and we uh, talked about this, well, the first request of Hosea was for him to find a prostitute and to marry her and have kids with the prostitute. Pretty intense. Sometimes we mirror the study that we're doing in the main service with children's ministry. This time we chose to kind of avoid that. So it's pretty uh, intense topic here, uh, but really showing the intense and uh, really the title of our uh, series, Relentless Love for a Broken Bride, because we're seeing, as I mentioned last week, we're seeing that, man, our God is crazy about us in the measures that he'll go to get our attention. And we've learned a lot about that. In fact, you see a little bit of his uh, intensity in the way that he described or commanded Hosea to name his three children. Do you guys remember this? Here's a, a family picture of theirs. Uh, can you imagine the Christmas card? First son, his name was God Will Scatter. Uh, his daughter came along and uh, she was a beautiful little girl. What with the name, what? No mercy. And then of course the last, the, the, the son, other son, not my people. So these are the names. That give, you get the sense that God's trying to get a point across maybe through this, probably wanting to convey something. We learn a lot about his character through this study. We learn some things that, uh, some things we like, some things not so much. But the one thing that's the overarching theme is that he is affected by his people. He's affected by us. He's emotional about us. He, he notices, and here's the thing a lot of times people neglect to realize, he notices when our affection is misdirected. Sometimes he thinks like, oh, he's, he's not really that concerned. No, he notices and recognizes when our affection is misdirected. And he's also not just a, a God of mercy, but also a God of justice. So we're feeling that tension in this book, especially between his mercy and his justice. Ultimately, he, he would always rather extend mercy, which is good news for us. So some of us, upon reading this, might ask yourselves the question, of, okay, so this is Old Covenant. This is the Old Covenant, Old Testament. How does this relate to me? Anybody kind of wonder some of that? You're like, how does Hosea, we're obviously now under grace. Somebody even asked me a, a, a couple of weeks ago, just like, wait a second, I, I thought we're under a, a new covenant and there's no condemnation under Christ Jesus. But here's the thing to understand. Just because we're children of God and embrace grace and the forgiveness through Jesus Christ doesn't mean that we still don't experience the discipline of God in our lives. Anybody recognize that? The discipline of God in our lives. Growing up, I don't know if any of you had a, a dad that was very committed to uh, discipline. My dad was pretty tough on me, I'll be honest with you. He was kind of had this nice balance between uh, really loving well, but then also really disciplining hard. I remember one particular time we were at a, a Walmart or Kmart, I think, back then, and there was some kid just throwing a tantrum in the aisles. And I remember him leaning over to my mom and just saying, Oh, if I could just have one week with that kid. Just give me <laughs> one week with that kid. We could, we could change everything with discipline. And you, you think about that still today. That's how God is with us. In fact, he's really clear in the New Testament. In verse 6 of chapter 12 of Hebrews, it says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. He goes on in verse 11. Listen to this. He says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, 
but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. His desire for us is that the outcome of his discipline would be transformation and change in our life, that literally we'd be conformed more into what? His likeness. We come and we start to see the the peace that's on the side of doing things within the parameters that he's set, The, the, the peace that comes from righteousness. So that's the outcome. And the thing that we're gonna see in the text is that he uses all kinds of strategic ways to get our attention. It's just not what, like the, it's not like the angry dad that just flies off the handle and snaps and, and, and gets mad. He, he, he's more strategic and, and, and caring in his approach. And a lot of times he uses one means to get one person's attention, another means for another person. It's, it's kind of based on the kid. Anybody do that with your own kids? You're like, this discipline measure doesn't really work with them, but it works with them. You kind of adjust accordingly with kids similarly with our God. So we're excited to look at some of the, the overlap and still how he operates today to shape us and, uh, and, and to really an invitation for us to grow and be shaped more into his likeness through discipline. Let me pray though before we explore this passage. Dear Lord, we invite you now to speak to us, speak through your word that we wouldn't resist your discipline, that we'd submit to it. I like to think of we're coming one way or the other, whether we come willingly or with resistance. My hope is that as a church that we would be aware of your discipline, that we'd have eyes to see it, and that we'd adjust in response to it. God, we ask that through this text that we'd be more like yourself, God. We know that that's only possible with your Holy Spirit working behind the scenes, so we invite that even now. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, so chapter 2 in Hosea, we'll start in verse 1. It says this, Say to your brothers, you are, my, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Let's stop there just for a quick moment. Basically, we are the ones that installed kind of the separations of chapters. This is the concluding thought of the last section when he was talking about mercy. Basically, it's a call to make sure that once we've experienced mercy, that we share it and communicate it with others. Are you tracking with me? So it's kind of a, a finished or a footnote to last week's message. Now moving to kind of the new message, verse 2 with a new quotation marks there. It says, plead with your mother, plead, using the word plead twice there, for she is not my wife. And I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. All right, we'll stop there. And again, the reasons why we're not covering this in children's ministry. Uh, here, you, you get the idea here that, this, that, that there's a, a pleading with her to turn from her ways. There's a, if anyone's been following the Lord for any extended period of time, you could never say, man, he didn't give me any chances. He didn't give me any opportunities to turn back. He, he, he implemented discipline right away. There's no, ch- are you kidding me? Our God, if there's anything he's not, he's not impatient. He's the one that's long suffering and gives plenty of opportunity to turn. You see here with them, as I've already mentioned, he's referring to Israel. And you kind of jump back and forth between Gomer and between Israel. And it's kind of this thread of these uh, physical character and the spiritual reality that's happening with Israel that's been unfaithful. Are you tracking with me? So a little bit of both you're going to see in the text. Well, Israel, he's using some pretty intense language because she's been unfaithful. Similar to if you talk to a husband that's recently found out that his wife was having an affair. You wouldn't necessarily expect to have like a nice, calm demeanor. There would be some intensity in the tone, right? And so similarly here, he's saying Israel has time and time again been unfaithful to me. Second Kings 17, we're not going to go through that here this morning, but it gives a specific list of all of these adulteries. Adultery is when a spouse seeks intimacy with a third party, in case you're confused on that. Adulteries worshipped other gods, imitated other nations, engaged in pagan rituals, didn't obey God's law, stiff-necked, unteachable, didn't trust God, sacrificed their own children to pagan gods, practiced sorcery, sold themselves to evil. The list goes on for all of the infidelities of Israel before Christ, before God. And say, he's saying, man, because of that, 
Look at the intense language. He says to them, she is not my wife. Pretty intense. Jeremiah 3 8 describes the same idea. It says, For all the adulteries of the faithless one Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. This was a breaking point in the relationship. God is saying, listen, you have crossed lines. You have crossed lines. But the fascinating thing, the same time he's saying that, what do you, what do you see in that same little couple verses? Plead with her to come back. Plead with her to come back. Our God always, always offers that invite. It's been neat the last couple of years that we have so many different women's Bible studies that meet here during the week and uh, have different studies. One of them has been doing the study in the book of Hosea. And uh, it was uh, neat to see them kind of diving in. Anybody in here been through that study with the, the ladies? A couple uh, here for sure. And uh, I was going through some of their notes and I was looking at that and I was like, you know what I really liked in this section? Because they didn't focus on like a uh, turn from idols. They focused their time more on, well, what does it look like to bring our heart before God? What does that look like when it is in a healthy place? And they did a little mini study. I thought this was interesting. Anybody ever go through those five love languages that you have in a relationship? The, uh, the, the time spent with them, the gifts, the words of affirmation, like all this list. They're saying, man, that, that kind of stuff applies even to us when we're trying to develop that relationship. Man, even just implementing those times, quality time spent what if we infuse that into our week of coming back to God? What if we had acts of service, generous gifts in his name, verbalizing your affection to him? All of those things are ways to come back and not be a gomer. Like, that's kind of fun to say, not be a gomer, right? Where you're just wandering off to all these different lovers. Because if we don't, if we don't, and this is the important thing, even with our kids, we're like, you should do this, but if you don't, there's some negative repercussions. Verse three, lest, in other words, if you don't, lest I strip her naked, whoa, and make her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. Stop there again. Again, uh, this is one of the, the sides of uh, teaching God's word is I get to say, I didn't write this. Uh, I didn't, I'm just reading it as we're learning about our God and his response to our infidelity. It says, lest, and you start to see here a beginning of kind of his response to neglect of that relationship. When we wander off, he says, less because of that, and there's really two sides of his discipline. It's kind of either active, in other words, he's actively involved in responding to our neglect, or passive, and the passive, I would suggest, is almost a scarier place. Passive is where he steps back and says, good luck with that. Will let you enjoy the outcomes of that choice. The idols in which you worship, you're going to start to experience how one, they're disappointing, two, they're dangerous, and three, they're always going to leave you, what do you see here? Thirsty and dry. He described her like a wilderness, make her like a parched land, kill her with thirst. And that's what happens every time we take our attention or our affection anywhere other than where it was attend, intended to be. The process of this is often very similar to kind of in a, in a real relationship. You're left feeling uh, empty, but it starts out feeling when we're chasing other idols, it starts out feeling all right. It's kind of, I would describe this as the infatuation stage. When you start with a new idol, there's something about it and you're like, wait a second, I'm pretty good at making money. I kind of like the results of increased income. I kind of like to plan and to strategize and to map out my life from start to finish. I kind of like the pursuit of relationships. But here's the thing. You start to think in the infatuation stage, maybe God was wrong about this. Maybe God was wrong about this. Maybe this thing is good. 
Maybe it is worthy of my affection. Maybe this unhealthy relationship, God was off on that. It's okay. It's been great so far. But here's what happens after that, that infatuation stage is what? The honeymoon is eventually over. All of a sudden, it takes more and more to squeeze the same degree of satisfaction out of the same thing, and it's a, a law of diminishing returns. And before you realize it, you're like, oh, I'm left thirsty and parched. And he's like, man, I, I tried to warn you. I tried to invite you to come back, but I said, I'm just stepping away and letting you experience where that ultimately takes you. And it ultimately takes us to some really dark places. It was a really d- difficult Thing to discover in the month of January. I haven't shared about it here as a church. We have some uh, good friends, uh, not friends that you talk to all the time, but we uh, end up on this trip that we go to the East Coast to Ocean City each summer. It's kind of a family tradition to say the least. And one of the uh, families that we visit each year, uh, they've been super hospitable uh, to us over the years and really sweet family. And they're a little older than I am. They have a son that's, I think he's around uh, 20 years old now. And all the way through, raised him in a solid Christian family, raised him up to Father Lord. He's, he's got four siblings, and they're all kind of raised in the, just this one son that was just, just determined to just kind of go his own direction. And, and every road that he'd go, any, any time they'd suggest coming back to God, just wasn't interested. And in the month of January, we found out the news that he had actually died of an overdose of drugs. We're just like, oh man, the empty roads that the things of this life take us to. They promise to s- deliver. They, they promise, and that's a, so much of what sin is, is exposing it for the lie that it is. It's a big promises. Hey, this is gonna be awesome. This is gonna be fulfilling. This is gonna be great. And then you're like, wait a second. It left me wanting once again. It left me feeling empty and, and parched, and it's a liar. So the, the question that I think is so important for us to ask is where do I expect my good to come from? Where do I expect my good to come from? Asking that of the, looking across the landscape of your life, what, where are you trying to squeeze good out of? Are you trying to squeeze it out of the wrong places? Maybe you're further along in that process. Where do I go when things aren't good to be the answer to what's not good? In other words, when things are crummy, what's the thing that you go to try to make up for that lack? Here you see in the text, it says, for she said, after she's feeling empty and dry, for she said, I'll go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. Basically, she has this misconception that those things are actually going to be what satisfies. So she keeps on going back. May we learn from Gomer. Here, continuing the text, another form of discipline that he uses It's a little bit more direct opposition. Verse 6, therefore, you'll notice in each one of these sections now, it starts with the word therefore. So in other words, since she chose to go her own direction apart from me back to her old lovers, therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them and shall seek them but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Stop there, pretty intense. Basically, now where you're seeing his passive involvement, now you're starting to see his active involvement. He says that he's going to hedge up her way with thorns. In other words, frustrate all of her efforts. And so often in our life, that's how God chooses to respond to us. When we're wandering and we're chasing others, he's like, all right, I love you too much to let you keep going down that road, so I'm going to get in the way as much as as possible. He describes it as build a wall against her. I know that's an unpopular idea right now, but here's the, the idea. Building, he's, he's going to oppose and get in the, every way possible to what's happening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thwart her plans. Maybe you've experienced this form of discipline. I, as I look back and reflect over the years, uh, I would say that I have. Adrian and I here, I'll share a little example. Adrian and I, when I first, when we first got married, 
uh, we had uh, pretty meager salaries, uh, about 22000 a year. So just to give you a sense of kind of starting pay, it was pretty, pretty tight uh, to say the least. And so we had this plan that we were going to be, uh, or this is probably more my issue than her issue. Uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll own this, that uh, she's nodding uh, clearly. That instead, we were going to have a variety of rental properties and all the income, here's a picture of uh, my view, uh, all of the income would then help offset the lack of income coming in. Do you see what I'm saying? Anybody else have some of these dreams of grandeur? But I'll tell you what, over the years, I feel like God's, t we, we know that we are up to four places that uh, derailed, uh, and I lost at the game of Monopoly. What I've realized is I really sense that God likes it better when I'm in a place of dependence than when I'm in a place of self-sufficiency. Uh, and that, do that doesn't mean go act uh, frivolously with your money. I'm just dependent on him. I'm not saying that, right, Bill? Uh, like, be wise with your resources, uh, for sure. But I just get the sense, like, he just likes me to be in a place where he's just like, I, I still need you. I I'm dependent on you. And I don't know what your thing is that he, no matter how far you've tried to go down that road, he's like, you know what? I'm putting a hedge up there. I'm going to save you from yourself. I'm going to save you from yourself. And here's what he's doing in this case with Gomer. He's like, man, I'm going to, man, I, I love her too much to watch this. I can't, I, I can't see it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block this way. I'm going to block that way. I'm going to keep her from chasing this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to oppose this on every possible front. And that's so often the form in which he operates for discipline. I love verse 8. It says, and she did not know that I was it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil. And he, he, he's like, she was confused all along. She was thinking that it was Baal, and he's kind of mixing this two worlds again, like I mentioned Israel along with Gomer, and saying they thought, they thought Baal was the one that was going to provide for them. This is how Baal worshipped then, is they saw him as the god of the harvest. And so they would bring all of these different uh, uh, sacrifices before him. I mean, it got pretty dark even, even sacrificing children before, before Baal in that day and age. And all of this, and it was a transactionary relationship. I'll bring this before you in response that Baal would then provide the rain, the sun, the harvest. This would be the exchange that they would have. And they couldn't take the gamble or the risk to step away because they're like, oh, I can't gamble on losing the harvest. So they keep on this transactionary relationship. And I love that God's saying, they didn't even realize it all came from me. It all came from me. It's brokenhearted in that. Verse nine, he says this, therefore, therefore, in other words, since they didn't realize it was from me, I'll take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season. And I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. I will put an end to all her mirth or feasts or new moons or Sabbaths and all her appointed feasts. I'll lay waste her vines and her fig trees of which she said, these are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her rings and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Basically, you see a theme in that section there. Therefore, because you missed the fact that I'm the giver of all these gifts, God is saying, I will take back, I will take away, I will uncover I will put an end. I will lay waste. I will punish. Basically, he's saying, I'm going to remove the blessings that you were thinking were associated with Baal. I'm going to remove those. And that often is another means of God's response to his kids to get our attention, right? Anybody notice that in your life as well, where all of a sudden he's like, man, it sure seems like he's pulling away stuff to get my attention. Sure seems like he's drying up some wells for me. He says, all of that was because they went after her lovers and forgot me. One of the more significant conversations I've had, even in the six years that I've been here on staff, 
was when John Irwin and I actually visited a gentleman in our church. His name's Kenny Cleveland. I'll share this story because he's shared with it a number of times publicly. Kenny passed away uh, last year, but we visited Kenny in Chino Hills Correctional Facility. And he was on the other side of what I would propose and what he suggested was this. He had had things taken away from him in response to inconsistent patterns of worship in his life. Patterns of worship where it elevated the wrong things would be his description. And on, in that, that conversation, he's just like, you know what, God had to take away my, my job. He had to take away my house, my, uh, all these things in order to finally look back to him. He said it, and it was interesting because it wasn't out of a anger or frustration. He's like, man, but my relationship with God has never been better. All of that stuff was exposed for what it was, was just a false idols. And he's explaining, and it's a pretty awesome story to see his changed heart on the other side of that, was saying, man, it was all worth it. So often God has to take away stuff because when do we have the best view of God? When we're laying on our back, right? When we're laying on our back. And that's one of the tools that he uses to discipline his kids. All of these, none of these are outside of the bounds of what he's still able to do to get our attention. And all of these were used in the case of trying to reach out and draw the affection of Israel as they kept on wandering to other false gods. So some of you are like, man, Scott, is there, is there any hope in this, in this passage? You've been like doom and gloom. I'm sorry to visitors here. It's not always like this. Verse 14, take a look at this. Here's what I want you to do, though. So here's active participation. We'll wake up a little bit. In this section, if you have a pen, I want you to help me get a count of how many times we see these two words, I will. How many times you hear those two words in the remaining section? Are you guys able? You guys ready? All right, so let's get a count. Therefore, basically, therefore, what, why is that therefore? Because of her infidelity and she keeps forgetting about me. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And there shall uh, there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. Again, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things on the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, the war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Whoo, pretty awesome. How many I wills did you hear? Any? Nice, we have some good students in here. That's awesome. 14 different times in that section, 25 times in the entire chapter. So often I hear people's complaint about our God. Well, he seems like he maybe created things and stepped away and is uninvolved. You're like, God must be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm so involved with your lives. If you would just have eyes to see it. So often it's the pursuit of us to get our attention. So, lo so often it's the wooing phase, but it's also the restoring phase. What does the I will represent in that section? I will what? Fix this mess. I will fix this mess. That's what he's coming in to do. He's saying, uh, therefore, I will, and look at the text there. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. He's so different than us, isn't he? 
when someone's betrayed us, when someone's been unfaithful to us, are we looking to lure them back, to speak tenderly? Are we wanting to get our point across and tell them how they blew it? No, he's saying, I want to tenderly lure you back and I'm going to take all the stuff that was broken, all the things that were taken away and I will restore those for you. I'll bring them back. He's saying, despite your infidelity, I'm going to make it all right. I'm going to fix this mess for you. How awesome would it that our God would descend to woo a wayward people. I like this statement. I don't know where it originates. If you've had a thousand other lovers, this doesn't disqualify you from the love of God. It only sets you up to better experience it. A thousand different lovers doesn't disqualify you. It sets you up better to experience. He's saying, it doesn't matter where you've been or how unfaithful you've been. Man, I want to come and lure you, draw you back to myself. Goes through some pretty meaningful statements in the, this, and the audience would even know these different things much better. A couple, for instances, he says, I'll give her her vineyards and make the valley of a core a door of hope. Back in Joshua chapter 7, you might remember the story of Achan. Remember Achan? They were told not to steal anything from the Jericho. They were said, and, and what did Achan do? Stole the bacon, right? T took it. He was actually uh, punished, actually executed. And guess where Achan was actually punished for his disobedience? In the valley of Accor. Basically here, he's saying, I'm going to take this place that was meant for judgment. I'm going to make it a place of hope. I'm going to take all these things that were broken and I'm going to fix them all. Your unfaithfulness, I'm going to make it a vow that you can never break. And he says, you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my Baal. That was something I meditated some on this week. That's kind of an interesting statement. You'll call me my husband, no longer call me my Baal. What does that mean? What did I say about the relationship that they had with Baal? It was what? A transactionary relationship. You do this for me, and then I'll provide the sun and the rain and the harvest, right? That's the, that's the deal. And a, you have to give some really miserable sacrifices to appease me and appeal to me. Here's what God's saying. I don't want that kind of relationship with you. I, I, I don't want a transactionary setup. I want to be your husband. I want to be your love. I want to be the object of your affection, not based on do this in exchange for this. And so many of us still treat God like that and kind of a transactionary mentality and this, this thinking and saying, I, I don't want that. It's not like if you read your Bible, you're a good kid and everything's going to go well with you. That, that, that's not the kind of relationship I want. I want you to do things out of love for me. That's what he's setting up. No longer Baal, but husband. He goes through all of these different things that he's going to restore and make new. No longer a transactionary relationship. I will betroth you to me forever. Here's the interesting thing. Some of this, when you're studying Old Testament, you're like, well, when's that? What's that talking about? When's that, when's that day coming? When, when's that going to happen? The good news here this morning, and we ended with this last week, is guess what? Those things already happened through a person named Jesus Christ. God in the flesh made all of this possible. You read some of these Old Testament things, you're like, man, I would not want to be the object of God's wrath. That does not sound good. Guess who was the object of his wrath? Jesus was the object of his wrath. He absorbed all of it on our behalf so that we could be restored, giving us a choice, every single one of us a choice, whether or not we embrace that or we say no thank you. But on the other side of no thank you, man, I read this text and I'm like, uh, I don't want to be Gomer in this. I don't, I don't want to be the, 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 the object of God's uh, judgment. I, I want to receive the grace where he's filling the gaps left and right. He's the fix-it person. Here's the invite for us is it should change one if you've never embraced Jesus Christ, man, what an invite that's constantly on the table. Just to humble yourself and say, I can't fix this mess. I've been unfaithful way too many times. I embrace Jesus, what you did for me on the cross. That's a moment-by-moment a -moment invitation, and you can't neglect that. On the other side, for those of us that have, man, this should give the degree of freedom and praise, there should be like a skip on our, in our step, a whistle on our lips. Like, are you kidding me? Like all of this that he's done for me. 
the extent that he's reached out to his unfaithful bride is unbelievable. It should direct our worship. Let me pray. God, I thank you for this picture. And as hard as it, as it is to read, and sometimes a bit intense, I think it gives a glimpse to the degree of passion that you have for us. To many, but probably like, if many are like me, they probably think that doesn't even make sense. Like, how could you love me that much? It's really mind-blowing to think about. But you do, you have, and you've gone the extra mile to woo us. Even in these moments, I believe in this room, there's some people being wooed right now. They've put you off for so long, but you keep chasing them, pursuing them, making yourself irresistible. I pray that this would maybe be the end of that fight today. Somebody would bend a knee and make the choice to embrace you. For those of us that are walking with our their heads down and with a negative spirit and kind of a tone of defeatism, God, I just pray that this would be something that renews spirits, that we're no longer slaves to Baal. We're now children, beloved children, and husbands, brides, whatever picture, family picture you want. That's what we are before a perfect, loving God. Pray that that sinks into the core of who we are, to the depths of our soul. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. That is really good news, isn't it? What a beautiful reality. It really paints a, a clearer picture when you see the other side. It all of a sudden amplifies the, how great it is, the work that he's done for us on our behalf, his I will statements. He's fixed it all because of his grace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. If you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, I'd be thrilled to chat with you about what that relationship looks like following the service. Otherwise, we have a couple volunteers here are available. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.